So let's get into the meal. And the meal is served from Genesis 27, verses 1 through 10. I'm reading from the message. When Isaac had become an old man and was nearly blind, he called his eldest son Esau and said, My son, yes, father, I'm an old man, he said, and I might die any day now. Do me a favor. Get your quiver of arrows and your bow and go out into the country and hunt me some game. Then fix me a hearty meal, the kind that you know I like, and bring it to me to eat so that I can give to I can give you my personal blessing before I die. Rebecca was eavesdropping as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. As soon as Esau had gone off to the country to hunt game for his father, Rebecca spoke to her son Jacob. I just overheard your father talking with your brother Esau, he said. Bring me some game and fix me a hearty meal so that I can eat and bless you with God's blessing before I die. Now, my son, listen to me. Do what I tell you. Go to the flock and get me two young goats. Pick the best. I'll prepare them into a hearty meal, the kind your father loves. Then you'll take it to your father He'll eat and bless you before he dies. Let us pray. Father, we ask that you send your word. Send it with power, send it with love, send it under the unction of your Holy Spirit. Speak a word that will change our lives for the rest of our lives. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Just so you can know where we are, we, we started a sermon series before Advent season. And the series was entitled Living with Difficult People. And section one dealt with what? Y'all remember? Toxic people. Toxic people. We're going into section two. Section two is dealing with codependency. Codependency. Today's sermon is entitled that it's an overview. Codependency, colon, hate that feels like love. Hate that feels like love. Codependency, definition. Pertaining to a relationship in which one person is physically or psychologically addicted as to alcohol or gambling, and the other person is psychologically dependent on the first in an unhealthy way. Another definition. Codependency is defined as the, addi the uh, addiction to a supportive role in a relationship. It means you're trying to make a relationship work with someone who is not trying to make the relationship work. Codependency. The codependency movement was born out of a link between uh, those who studied alcoholism and those who took care of alcoholics. You know, um, the person that was alcoholic, they called dependent. And the person that took care of them, the carers, they called enablers. They later defined these enablers as being codependent. They discovered that these carers or these enablers would adjust or uh, adapt their behavior in such a way as to cover up the flaws that the alcoholic was uh, demonstrating. So these codependent people would uh, lie, would cover up, would take emotional obligation for the behavior of the alcoholic so the alcoholic could act out without consequence. After some time, psychologists saw the similarities between alcoholics and those caring for other people. And so now, codependency takes on a variety of relationships and not just alcoholism or gambling. Just about anybody that's in a one-sided love relationship is codependent. I'm, I'm talking about a romantic, one-sided love relationship. But also in a a familiar, a family, one-sided love relationship. Nobody else know what I'm doing. Y'all look so hard. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Parents who protect their children from facing the challenges of life are often suffering from codependency. 
Organizations that do not require excellence from their members are often suffering from codependency. Governments that offer programs that provide incentives for the poor to stay poor and for the rich to stay rich are suffering from codependency. Uh, at its heart, codependency hurts everybody in the relationship. That means we need some new mics. We'll put them in a new church. Amen. <laughs> At its heart, codependency hurts everybody in the in relationship. To illustrate that, let me give you the example I discovered in the military. In the military, there was a group of alcoholics we call functional alcoholics. These people on their job were water walkers, and many of them had rose to the highest rank structure in their particular track. There were E nines on E eights on the enlisted side, and there were colonels and captains. In the Navy, on the on the uh, on the officer side of the house, and even on their job, no one suspected that they were alcoholics until something went wrong. But these same people that looked so good on the job, when you went to their home, you found out that this water walker spent his whole evening in front of the TV drinking beer. Now the reason this thing could work is that this this water walker had a spouse. And that spouse held his world or her world together. You see, that spouse made sure that nobody knew he was an alcoholic. That spouse made sure that the children didn't bother that alcoholic while he was sitting in front of the TV every night, drunk out of his mind, watching the games and drinking beer. That, that, that spouse, you know, that spouse made sure that his uniform for the next day was spit and polished. And so that spouse enabled him to remain an alcoholic. Now, the truth be told, had the military system been allowed to work in that gentleman's life or that woman's life, the military system would have revealed that he or she was an alcoholic. And the military system would have sent him or her through treatment, and they would have recovered. But because there was this spouse who had this big secret and didn't want everybody to know that person remained alcoholic. Let me tell you about the spouse. The, 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 the burden of carrying this secret for so many years poisons her or him. And, and, and their life is miserable. They feel trapped and unable to get out. Let me tell you about the children. The children of this family are either going to become alcoholics statistically or become codependent. Codependence. Let's look at our text. We see Jacob and Rebecca are in a codependent relationship. You know, the word Jacob means heel grabber or supplanter. Jacob gets his name because even before he was born, he was wrestling in his mother's womb trying to take his brother Esau's place. When Esau comes out the womb first, little Jacob, prenatal Jacob, reaches out his hand and grabs his heel as if he's going to pull it back in. As if to say, I'm going to be the firstborn. You're not going to be the firstborn. So they named him for his behavior. They called him Jacob, the supplanter. And the word Jacob can be translated into several different ways in the, from the Old Testament word. It can be translated usurper, one who wrongfully or illegally seizes and holds the place of another. Here's some synonyms for you. Conniver, charlatan, chiseler, con artist, confidence operator, Cousiner, crook, deceiver, defrauder, dodger, double crosser, double dealer, enticer, fake, hypo hypocrite, imposter, masquerader, pretender, rascal, rogue, scammer, sharp, sharper, shyster, swistler, and twister. That's what a Jacob is. Now let me say, Jacob's dad, Jacob's 
Esau, it said that that was Isaac's son. But referring to Jacob, it said it was Rebekah's son. Right. And, and what the text was telling us in a subtle way is that Rebekah was, that was her favorite boy. Now they're twins, but that was her favorite boy. That was the son that she loved. And because of that, she felt it was unfair. Unfair that just because he was born second, he was relegated to a secondary life. You see, according to the Old Testament traditions, when you look at this, Esau would inherit everything that Isaac owned. And, and, and poor little Jacob wouldn't have gotten much more than a servant would get. And she just didn't like that because that was her son. And so she did whatever she had to do to make it better for her son. Let's get three points in here. Point one. Protecting a loved one from the consequences of life is often a sign of codependency. See, that's where she messed up. She was trying to protect him from the consequences of life. Jacob was Rebecca's favorite son. She wanted him to have the best. But you know the situation. He was the second son. While every parent, spouse, neighbor, or friend wants the best of their loved one, protecting them from the harsh forces of life may be just the opposite of what God has planned for that loved one. During the children's sermon, we watched a little chick head out of the egg, and as we watched that little chick, it was very difficult for that little chick to get out. But you know the very struggle that it took for that chick to get it out was the struggle that it took for that chick to become a full-grown chicken. Many, many times when we feel that we're helping someone, we're hurting them by breaking the shell before it should be broken. Helping a child with homework is healthy. Doing a child homework every night might destroy them. Helping a child deal with a strict teacher is healthy. Telling the teacher off and letting the child know will destroy that child. Helping a young person to transition from high school to the adult world is healthy. Allowing grown people to live carefree in your house will destroy them. Allowing an adult to be an adult is healthy. Allowing an adult to be a child will destroy him. Giving a loved one a financial gift during a difficult time is healthy. Lending money to a friend or relative can destroy a relationship. Now some of you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Proverbs 27, 7, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower yeah. is slave to the lender. Now if they come and they ask them, when did you give it to them, that's fine. But don't lend money to your loved one and make sure. This is what oh, one person said. It makes your Thanksgiving dinner taste funny. <laughs> Even when you don't hold it over there, they know. How do you feel when you lend someone some money? You give them four or five hundred dollars and they say they're going to pay you on payday. They've been calling you every day and, and payday comes and they don't remember your number anymore. <laughs> you see them two or three days later and they turn the other way like you can't see you. That money is destroyed. Get it if you're going to have it, but don't lend it. You know what lend means in the black community? Give me more than you were planning. You, you know, you say, give me $20, but lend me 50 Lend me 50 I'll pay it back. So you pay it back unless you get more than they were planning to give you. Give what you plan to give and don't worry about it. Don't hold it over their heads. You know, when someone owes you money, and then you see them with some new bling bling or <laughs> it hurts the relationship. You owe me all that money. That's right. I can't afford to go and eat out at such and such and then you are at so and so eating out. That looks like lobster. My goodness. All that Nicky D's. You owe me money. You got sick and lobster. Y'all got what I'm saying, right? Y'all just. 
Helping a loved one to get a car by giving them a financial gift can be healthy. Co-signing for a loved one can destroy a relationship. Oh, when I used to sell cars, the hardest thing was when I saw this young guy with grandma. Oh, that would hurt. I felt like saying, son, you can't buy. But he brought grandma because he knew he couldn't buy. And grandma credit good. And they sit down there and, and, we, and he's, you know, you go through the deal and they say, well, she's going to co-sign. You know who's going to pay for that car? Grandma. That's not right. Not right. The Bible says, my son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if you be a co-signer, if thou hast struck in thy hand with a stranger, if you sign for it, thou art snared by thy word. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. Do this now, my son, and deliver thyself without coming to the hand of thy friend. Go humble thyself and make thy, self, and make thy friend sure. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thy eyelids, until thou deliver thyself as a roll out of the hand of the hunter. For those of us who took uh, Dave Ramsey, he calls this gazelle intensity. When you co-sign for someone, get out of that deal as quick as you can. Even if it means pain. Because that's going to hit your credit when they don't pay. And you know the truth? You can ask them, are you paying the loan? Someone's going to tell you the truth. So here you're walking around thinking the loan is current and your credit getting hit left and right. That's not in here. That's free. <laughs> what was that point again? Anybody wrote it down? Can be a sign of codependency. Point two, codependency turns love into hate and hate into love. Right. One of the difficult aspects of codependency is that it makes love feel like hate and hate feel like love. When moms are so healthy, capable, educated, articulate, young man sleep in her house, eat her food, drive her car, watch her cable TV, play games on her computer that she doesn't even know how to turn on. And not, oh, that's not in there either. And not charge that young fellow one penny of rent. In the short term, that might be love. But after a year or two, that love acts like hate. It traps that young man and relegates him into a life of mediocrity. He never discovers his gifts and his calling. He never finds that not only did his parents give him roots, but they also gave him wings. He never experiences the wholeness that comes from being excellent without excuse. I know the mics aren't doing all that, but are they on? <laughs> When parents set firm, calm, 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 and reliable boundaries for a teenager. Boundaries like no dating until you're old enough. You must be home before it's too late. Zero tolerance for drug and alcohol use. You can't be a friend with the wrong crowd. If you're too sick to go to church, you're too sick to go any place else. Amen. No more than a few hours of television or com uh, a computer work any one night. No boys or girls, depending on the gender, in your room. No visitors in our house when we're not here. No talking back to adults. Now, now, now these are healthy boundaries. And when a parent sets these healthy boundaries, for a teenager, often they are responded to by manipulation and passive aggressive drama that times pure emotional meltdowns. And you may even hear something like a, you don't understand me and I hate you. That feels like hate. But let me tell you something. Many years later, when you go in the glory, 
to grow and fester might feel like love. It might feel like love not to be a nag. It might feel like love to be tolerant. It might feel like love to look the other way. But let me tell you, in fact, that's hate. Because as that seed grows, resentment grows, and anger grows, and frequently you find yourself telling other people, your confidant, your prayer partner, you find yourself telling them what you should be telling that person. You know, it's, it's wrong to be angry with a person and not tell them you're angry with them. That's why you're angry with them. person walks in the room and you find yourself turning your head the other way. Never told them you're a man. This is not in my notes. <laughs> you know, probably you're mad because they haven't paid that money back. <laughs> it's been years now. <laughs> and they don't even bring it up. That part wasn't in my notes. <laughs> it's hatred to be angry with a person and not tell them why you're upset. Oh, yeah. Speaking out might seem like hatred, but that's love. Keeping silent might seem like love, but that's hate. No, no. <coughs> it feels like love when you're all alone and the hormones are flowing and the lights are dim. It feels like love when she says, oh, baby, baby, I love you, I love you. It feels like love when he says, I promise I'll never leave, I'll be with you for life. It feels like love when she says, ain't no mountain so high, ain't no valley so low.
Y'all all right? Yes. Point three. The key to avoiding codependency is to set healthy boundaries and to trust God. Rebecca and Jacob were in a situation where it didn't look good. Uh, Re Rebecca wanted more for Jacob, but society wanted less for Jacob. And, and that was a problem. Uh, that, that the cars look, the debt looked stacked against Jacob, and she didn't like that. We in the black community know how she feels. We've been in that situation too. I was listening to Ron Parsley this weekend. He said that we, are, we get it. We get it that God's love is unconditional, but we miss it that God's promises are. Y'all get that? God's love is unconditional, but God's promises are conditional. He said, if ye be willing, ye shall reap the fruit of the land. He said, give and it shall be given unto you. He said, forgive and I will forgive you. God's promises are conditional. God's love is unconditional. Yeah. One of my daughters was playing a game on me. And she, this some, what, what's that starting? in Kardashian or whatever? What is it? Kim Kardashian. Kim Kardashian. She said, if I did that, Daddy, would you love me in a yes? And I was married and then trying to divorce and got pregnant with somebody else. And, you know, she gave me the whole story because she knew I don't keep up with that stuff. And she said, would you love me? And I said, no. Nothing you can do to make me love you more. Nothing you can do to make me love you less. My love is unconditional. Yeah. But my anger is conditional. <laughs> my anger is conditional. You bring certain conditions in here, you won't experience my anger. But you still have my love. <laughs> oh, I finally got an amen in the church. Finally got an amen in the church. I can make our own. Say that again. <laughs> what Rebecca had to do is her part of the condition. If she just trained up her child in the way of the law, and that was her part. And then trusted God for the rest. Jacob would have been all right. You know, we have to learn how to trust. We can't fix everything. We can't make it all right. We can't break the eggshell off of our children. We have to learn how to trust the Lord. I'm going to do my part. And I'm going to commit it to God. And I'm going to trust the Lord. Yes, Lord. Oh, it's time people learn to trust God. Second Samuel 22, 31. He is the buck of all them that trust him. He, he'll buckle you up. He'll take care of you when you learn to trust him. Psalm 9, 10. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. I can't fix it. My little resource is not big enough, but I trust your Lord. The, the kid is screaming right now, calling to everything but a child of God, but I trust your Lord. My, my husband just slammed the door. I hear the engine turn on. He's going down the street, the same place I confronted him about. But I trust your Lord. The kids in college. Oh, and they're telling me that there's all kind of drugs there and all kind of sexual immorality. And I can't go to college every day. I can't walk over that child every day. But they told me to bring him up in the love and evolution of the Lord. And I've done all that I can do. Now I trust you. Oh, we oh, 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 oh. have to learn how to put the trust in the Lord. He said, uh, in the Lord, Psalm 11, 1, do I put my Oh, you can't be a good parent 